So it's very unfortunate, but I do make mistakes just like everyone else, except for those who consider themselves to be perfect. On one of my projects from a few weeks ago, I took this engine apart because it was broken, and when I reassembled it is when I realized that a critical part was broken, but I convinced myself that it was going to be okay. Well, I wouldn't be making this video if that had worked out, so I'm here to finally fix my terrible mistake. In today's video, we're going to be looking at this Craftsman branded lawnmower, and the problem is that when pulling on the rope, it feels like the rope is being yanked back out of your hands. In the last video on this machine, I reinstalled the old camshaft, but unfortunately its compression release was damaged. However, I installed it anyway thinking that since the engine's compression was going to be low from running with very little oil for almost two years, that it would make up for it, but it turns out I was very wrong. Now, I'm going to try and repair this mower, but yours might be a little different, so this might not work on yours. So if things are not working out for you, like in the video, please ask about it, and I'll be glad to answer your questions. Since getting the engine back together after installing a used piston and connecting rod and also having honed the cylinder, I was able to put about 30 minutes of run time on this engine. So at this point, the engine's used parts should have broken in with the old engine. That means it's finally time to get rid of the break-in oil and put some new oil in. I guess now would be a good a time as ever to open the engine up and do two things. See how it looks in there and also replace the bad camshaft with, you guessed it, another used one. There's also one other issue it's having, and that's a leaking valve cover gasket, so we'll have to address that issue as well. But before we get too far into this project, I want to show you the problem it's having. So when pulling on the rope, once you get to the compression stroke, it's really tough to pull, and that's with me pulling on it slowly. If you're trying to start it, and when you give it a hard pull, when the engine fights back, it will yank the handle right out of your hands, and if you're not ready for it, it can be very worrying, if not disconcerting. Of course, my plan is to eventually sell this mower, so I can't have it be like this, otherwise the buyer might not want it. The first thing we need to do is to get all the fluids out of the engine, and since I need to get the oil out, I might as well run the engine until it gets hot, that way the oil will drain better. And don't worry, even after draining the gasoline from the tank, there's still plenty of gasoline in the fuel line and in the carb to get the engine to run for about 3-4 to four minutes, which is plenty of time for the oil to get hot. Now I never noticed that clanking noise when the engine first starts or when it stops, but I have a pretty good idea what it is, and it's not the engine making the noise. See if you can figure out what it is later in the video. So after about 3 minutes of running, I'll then dump out the oil, and then you'll be able to see all the metal that was in the oil after having honed the cylinder and installing a different piston and rings. This is the break-in oil, and this is why you should always change your oil after your first mow with a brand new mower. After that, I'll then disconnect the pull rope from its guide on the handlebar and also the brake cable from the engine, then we'll move to the underside of the mowing deck. Now, I'm going to go through these next steps rather quickly, and the main reason why is because all these steps were shown in greater detail in the last video, but there should be enough detail that will show you all you need to know about removing the engine. Also, in the last video, I did a very good job of cleaning most every single part of this mower, but as you can see, even after just 30 minutes of use, there's a fair amount of grass stuck to it and everywhere else on the mowing deck. I'll probably clean it later on before I sell it, but right now, it's going to stay the way it is. After using my puller to get the blade adapter loose, I can finally take it off the crank by hand. I'll then follow that by taking off the three engine bolts, and it should come right off the mowing deck. So here's the evidence you need on how this engine got destroyed. As you can see, even after adjusting the valve cover gasket the best I could, it was still leaking onto this cover. Now, if you had left it like this and never bothered to check the oil for two years, then by the second season, the engine would have been very low on oil. And in the case of this engine, the connecting rod eventually broke, probably due to the piston getting very hot and wanting to get stuck in the cylinder. After getting the valve cover off the engine, you can see the dirt that's getting absorbed into the oil that's leaking from the valve cover. This, of course, is another reason why you need to keep your mower clean, that way you can see where the leaks are coming from. So this is the gasket for the valve cover, and what's strange about it is that it's a molded piece of rubber instead of a paper gasket. It looks to be a quality part except where it's lightly torn, but believe it or not, that's not why this gasket was leaking. 
Now, if we take a look at it, it seems to be the right shape and size when compared to the valve cover, but once in the engine, well, that's a different story. What you'll notice is that it seems to fit just fine, that is until you get closer to it, and what you'll notice is that the gasket seems to be too big for the space available, and for it to fit in the engine, it has to deflect somewhat near the bottom edge. And the deflection is causing the gasket to no longer fit in the engine, and that's what caused the original oil leak, resulting in a failed engine. I really do think it was like this from the factory, and I also believe it was leaking from the very first day they got it out of the box. It's unfortunate they didn't do anything about it, or maybe they didn't even notice it. The first step I'm going to take is to remove some of the valve train components from the head, because since I have to take the camshaft out of the engine, it'll leave the valve train without any tension on it, and this could cause some issues later on that I wasn't planning on. So I'd rather take them out now and put them back in later on, that way I won't be surprised by something bad happening to the valve train. The next step is yet another example of penny pinching, or better yet, another way to save a few bucks. Instead of buying a new gasket, I'm going to make my own. This is not all that difficult to do, and since I already had the gasket paper on hand, I didn't have to spend any extra money or wait for the part to arrive in the mail. So you might be saying to yourself, I can't believe you're trying to save a few bucks on a gasket. What kind of cheapskate are you? So here's the issue. If this gasket was only a few dollars, I'd buy it. But if you look up this part number and include tax and maybe some shipping, it's not just a few dollars. In fact, it's a whole lot of dollars for a tiny itty bitty gasket. That's the reason why I'm not buying it and making my own. So yes, trying to save five bucks would seem a bit foolish. And to be honest, I've done it before. But to keep from spending a lot more than just five bucks, I think it's worth it. If you don't think you can do it, then I understand if you just order the part, but if you can trace out a part, use a hole punch, and then use a knife and scissors to cut it out, then I'd give it a shot. Now, I did consider using some sort of a sealer for the gasket, but I wanted to try this out first, and to be honest, I think I did a pretty good job. After making sure that it fits the valve cover base, I then patted myself on the back and put my wallet back into my pocket and moved on to the engine. Now, having taken off the sump only two weeks ago, I'd imagine it wouldn't be as difficult as the first time. The only thing I have to deal with is the sealer, but this type doesn't get as bad as the other brands. After getting the bolts out of the sump, I'll then use the biggest hammer I have in my tool bag, give it a few quick love taps, and just like that, it's loose. After looking at the sump, you can see there's still some of that metal at the bottom. We'll just give it a splash of stale gasoline and let it do its thing. And by the end of the process, it should look a whole lot better. Now this might take more than one round, so be very patient. Now if you were ever curious if tipping your mower on its side would empty out all the oil, well here's your answer, it's a no. Turns out there's still about 3 ounces of oil in the engine that's pretty tough to get out even when tipping it over. We'll take care of that oil here in a bit, but first we need to get rid of the oil slinger and camshaft just so they don't fall out of the engine when we do get rid of the oil. Also, don't forget to take out the tappets as well, otherwise they could fall out and get damaged. If you look at the top of the tappet, you'll see the seat for the push rod. It's very important that when you install the push rod to make sure they land back into the seat, otherwise you may have starting issues. After that, we'll start the cleaning process for the rest of the engine. Now, we're not going to be able to get it completely clean, otherwise we'd have to take the entire thing apart. Besides, this is just a lawnmower and not a daily driving car. We only need it to run for the next few years and maybe with enough oil changes a few decades. So here is the bad camshaft. As you can see, there was some damage to the plastic, but it was not on a part that was all that important. However, if you get a bit closer to it, you'll see that it's missing the return spring, and more importantly, the metal tab that is the compression release is bent down. Unfortunately, it's bent too far to be put back into shape, and without the spring, it wasn't good anyway. Just for reference, this is the used one, and you can see just how much better it looks when compared to the damaged one. Now to save time, I'm going to try to make this as brief as possible, because while editing this video, it might end up being a bit longer than I want it to be. Just remember to put oil on all the metal parts that make contact with other metal parts. That's the reason why I'm using my pliers to install as much as I can, otherwise my camera is going to get covered in oil. Now when installing the camshaft, just make sure the marks line up between the timing gear and the cam gear, otherwise the engine is very unlikely to start, and if it does start, I doubt it's going to run very well. Also, make sure that the tip on the governor is touching the arm, because if it's not, there's a good chance that the engine could over rev when started and will end up with another broken engine. After that, I'm going to put more gasket maker around the block on the mating surface. Now, if you want to use the paper gasket here instead of gasket maker, be my guest. This is what I'm choosing to use, and for all the engines I've done this to, it's worked out very well. So I'm going to continue to use it until I start having issues. 
After putting a bead around both mating surfaces, I'll then use my finger to spread it out as evenly as possible, then it's time to reinstall the sump. Just be very careful when doing this and try not to force it. A few light taps on the sump with the handle of your screwdriver should be enough to get them to come together. Now the next part is the important one. I am not going to tighten the bolts just yet. Instead, I'm going to use minimal force on the bolts just so they make contact with the sump. The reason for this is because I don't want to tighten the bolts while the gasket maker is still wet, otherwise it might squeeze out from the mating surface. I'm just going to leave the bolts like this for the next 24 hours, at which point it should be cured and then I can torque them down. But in the meantime, I'm going to put the rest of the engine back together. Now for this part, I could have been a bit more cautious with because I'm pretty sure I set the valve lash on this engine the last time I did this. But then again, the used camshaft I installed might have a different amount of wear on it, which might explain why I have to do this again. Now, it's not a big deal because setting the valve lash is really not that tough to do. After setting the valve lash, I'll put the freshly made gasket for the valve cover on the engine, and it looks like there's just one small part I need to cut near the spring, but it's not a big deal. If I really need to, I guess I could just cut another one. Now I did use some sealer on the paper gasket just for a bit of insurance. After that, I'll reinstall the screws, tighten them down, and hope that it's going to work. So at this point, all we have to do now is to wait for 24 hours or something close to that, but of course temperature and humidity will have a part to play as well. So it's the next day and I'm ready to torque the sump bolts down. Do I really need to torque them down? And the answer is probably, but I've done this plenty of times without using it and they've always been fine, but I do like the idea that all the bolts are at the same torque. Once all the bolts are torqued down, I'll then put the engine back onto the mowing deck, reconnect the brake cable to the engine, and then put the rest of the stuff back on the underside of the mowing deck. Now, if you recall, there was a very slight knock when the engine started and right when it stopped the last time we had it running. Well, I think I know why I was doing that. Now, if you take a closer look at the blade adapter, you can see that it's a bit chewed up in the middle. What this means is that I think it's not allowing the blade to positively engage the adapter. And even though the bolt that holds the blade to the adapter is tight, it's allowing it to move on startup and shutdown. Now, I can either replace the adapter, which is more expensive than I think it should be, or I can modify it to allow the blade to engage it better. Right now, I'm not going to mess with it until I know this used camshaft works to fix our issue. We're almost done as far as the engine goes, aside from putting oil and gasoline in it. But there's just one more thing I want to do, which is to confirm that the compression release is working. And to find out if it is, I'm going to use my compression tester. Now, the tester will measure how much pressure the engine can make on the compression stroke. The higher the reading, the better it is. And if the reading is lower than it should be, well, we'll talk about that later. Right now, I want to see a reading under 70 PSI when using the pull rope. The compression release makes it easier to pull on the rope, but when I installed the bad camshaft, it meant that when using the rope, you'd have to fight against the full compression, and that's why the rope was hard to pull when it got to the compression stroke. So after pulling on the rope, we now get a reading of roughly 50 PSI, and even though that sounds bad, this is the reading I would expect it to have. What this means is that the used camshaft is working perfectly and we fixed our pull rope issue. But what happens when you use a drill to spin the engine this time? The last time we did this in the last video, we got a reading of very close to 175 PSI. So hopefully we get something very close to that reading this time. Now the reading is very close to the one we got last time. This time we got about 171 PSI, which is really good considering that when we got this engine, it was ran low with oil for a really long time and eventually caused the connecting rod to shatter into six pieces. The next thing I want to tackle has to do with how difficult it is to push this mower. So what you're seeing is footage taken before we service the wheels. And as you can see, the base readings we're getting are well over 3 kilograms, and the best one we got was 3.73 kilograms. To put that into perspective, anything over 3 kilograms is very difficult to push, and to me, it's quite unacceptable. Now, for a non-self-propelled mower, the reading should be in the range of 1.5 to 2 kilograms, and for a mower that's self-propelled like this one, the reading should be between 2 and 2.5 kilograms. Now the rear wheels don't seem to have any real issues with spinning, but I do want to lubricate them just to make sure they don't get worn out. Now, you don't have to take them off, especially when they spin this easily, but it does work a lot better when you do. Besides, you also get a chance to clean off any old dirt and grime from the axle before lubricating it. So here's one of the driven wheels, and as you can see, it's not spinning with any ease at all. For this one, we'll have to not only lubricate the axle, but also lubricate the drive shaft where the gear is at. 
Now, there's a lot more that we can do to try to get the wheels to spin a lot better, but we're going to try and keep it easy and not worry about going too far into the drive line. Only if this method doesn't work will I consider going any further, and that's because the other method means taking the front end apart, which is something I really don't want to do. So as you can see, it is spinning, but it's only marginally better. However, don't forget that the other drive wheel has not been serviced yet. But once it is, we'll do a pull test again, and hopefully it won't be in the threes. So this time, we got a reading of 2.85 kilograms, which is much better and a huge improvement. But let's do that one more time and see if we can get a better reading. This time with a much smoother pull, we get a reading of 2.48 kilograms, which is right where I'd expect it to be. And if you wanted to know, yes, it's now much easier to push than before. So this time, it was much easier to start, especially not having the rope pulled out of your hands when you least expect it. Now that we got this fixed, along with that leaking valve cover gasket, and of course the other annoying issue with it being tough to push, this mower is finally done. Oh, and that issue with that knocking noise is pretty much gone. The only difference from the last time is that I made sure to tighten the bolt for the blade a lot tighter than before. But if it does come back, I'll have to consider getting a new adapter, which is going to suck, or I'll just try modifying the adapter, which is more than likely what I'll end up doing. Now this is going to be somewhat of a surprising statement about this mower, but this one turned out to be one of the worst projects I've ever had to deal with. So why would I even say this? I mean, it looks like I got everything fixed, right? Well, that's the issue here. The amount of time I use to fix this mower isn't going to come close to the asking price for it. In fact, I'm going to lose money. Now, to be honest, I did it for the experience and also the sheer enjoyment, but this one almost took all the enjoyment right out of it. But would I do it again? Yes, I would, but I might choose to do it differently. So my question is, would you take on a project that was this involved? Fixing a broken engine, getting wheels to spin, and fixing a leak that caused it to fail. To be honest, if I knew it was going to be this rough, I'd definitely have to think about it for a while. Thank you for watching. I really do appreciate your time here. Please feel free to ask me any questions about this project or about your own projects. And I hope to see you in the next video.